we are uh, going to be launching into this new ser- series that we've talked about called This Is My Story. Uh, as we get started, I, I was kind of thinking about this question this week. Have you ever just completely failed to recognize somebody? Like someone that like you should have recognized, but you just completely missed it? I, I was thinking about it this week for myself, and I'm like, I feel like I do this a lot. I, kind of an embarrassing number of times that I've done this kind of a thing. It most often happens when I go to the grocery store, actually. Um, w- sometimes I'll go to the grocery store, and I will be walking around, and I'll hear someone say like, Hey, Chris, how's it going? And I'll look over, and, and it, it could be someone like from church that I haven't met yet, or someone who I'm Facebook friends with, or someone from like one of my kids' schools that for some reason they recognize me, but I don't recognize them. And so like I, I got to do one of these things where I'm like, hey, man, you know, <laughs> like, what's up, buddy? You know, like, <laughs> what do you say? Um, it's just embarrassing. It's terrible. The, the worst one, though, oh my goodness, you guys. There was a time where I completely failed to recognize my own dad. Okay, big time. Uh, now, I have to set this up a little bit, though. So my dad, uh, he kind of has a signature look, all right? And that is this big, full mustache. I got a picture of him up here. Okay, so this is a picture of my dad and me and my sister. This is Halloween 1986. Uh, I was Voltron right? Okay. And um, this is my dad. My dad, as long as I've been alive, he has had this epic mustache, all right? And, and he wears it proudly. He's 71 years old, still has the mustache, okay? Um, now, a few years after this, I, I, was, uh, I was about 12 years old, and my sister and I, we got done with school. We went over to my mom's office while we were waiting for my dad to get off of work to come pick us up. You know the drill, okay? So that, that, that was happening. But what he didn't tell us was that that day he was going to shave off his mustache, all right? So what, what this is, and this was crazy. So he, he comes into the office. He opens the door. He pokes his head in. I'm sitting there reading a book. He pokes his head in. He's like, hey, guys. I looked up at him for a good, I mean, I, I'd say a solid three to five seconds. Just like, is he talking to me? Who is this? Like, I, I, I had no clue who it was without the mustache. It was, it was ridiculous. And I went right back to reading my book. And he's like, Chris, it's me. I'm like, what? No. Like, I, I just had no idea. I couldn't recognize him. I think that so many of the struggles that we face as Christians, um, whether it's how to handle difficult circumstances in our lives, if we're struggling with sin and temptation, or even, or even simply not turning to Jesus for salvation itself. I think all of it comes down to one fundamental problem, and it's a failure to recognize who Jesus is and what he's promising us. It's just a failure to recognize Jesus. He's the, he's the creator of the universe. He's made me and you, and yet we don't recognize him. And the way that the church has described this over and over again is this idea of spiritual blindness. That sin in our life has blinded our eyes to be able to see who he is and what he's doing for us. We sing about it. I, I, I mean, the most famous hymn in uh, like you know, in Christianity is what? Amazing grace, right? And how does it go? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. What? Was blind, but now I see. And here's the point of that is that this is our story. Every single one of us has had this happen in our life. We were blinded by sin to who Jesus is. And then by God's grace, he's opened our eyes to see him to see who he is and and what he's done for us. This is our story. And so we're starting this series today, all through the month of November, we're going to be looking at conversion stories. In other words, stories of people in the Bible who become followers of Christ. And in these stories, we're not going to see how great these people are. We're not going to see how amazing their faith is or how wonderfully good they are and righteous and all that sort of stuff. We're going to actually see how good God is in the midst of this. We're going to see the glory of God and how the glory of God is revealed in the way that he's saving us. And I can't think of a better conversion story to start out with than the story of the woman at the well. 
in John chapter 4. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up right now to John chapter 4. And we're going to start at verse 7 today. As you're turning there, let me just sort of set up what this story, uh, kind of the beginning of this story. So, so Jesus and his disciples are in Jerusalem and they are uh, celebrating the Passover and it's time for them to leave. And so they pick up their things and they leave to head back home to Galilee. And it's about a three-day journey walking uh, north from Jerusalem up to Galilee. And as they're walking that way, it says in verse 4, that they have to pass through Samaria. And it's an interesting note to have that in there because it kind of begs the question, what's the deal with Samaria? Like, it says they have to pass through there, so why, and which we're not told. But why would they not want to? Well, Jews did not like Samaritans. That's like kind of, kind of this big theme that, that's happening in, in all of the Gospels. We see how much that the Jews did not like Samaritans. There's this religious tension between them. See, Samaritans, they were, historically, they're part Jewish, but they intermarried with some other nations. And so they had very different views about God and different views about the Bible and different views about worship. In fact, one of the biggest tensions that they had between the Jews and the Samaritans was where they were supposed to worship. Jews believed that you had to worship God. This is where you offered sacrifices and things. You did this in the temple in Jerusalem. And that's it. But the Samaritans said, no, no. Look, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain called Mount Gerizim. So we're going to worship here. Okay? And, and th- that caused this huge religious division where Jews were just like, that's it. We're done with you people. We don't want to have anything to do with you. We're going to go out of our way to make sure we never see you, never pass through Samaria Uh, all that sort of stuff. So there's this huge religious tension. They thought they were half-breeds. They thought they were impure. And so Jesus, he comes along with his 12 disciples, and they're walking through Samaria, and they come to a town called Sakaar, okay? And this little town, it's nestled between two mountains. One of them is Mount Gerizim, where where the Samaritans worshiped. And as they approach the city, it's around noon, and Jesus is beginning to get tired from the journey. And so right outside of the city, there's this well called Jacob's Well, and Jesus sits by the well, and his disciples head into town to get some food. And that's where we're going to pick up the story. I want to invite you to stand with us as we uh, read John chapter 4, starting at verse 7, out of reverence for God's word. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, And he would have given you living water. Our Father, we pray that you would illuminate your word to us. Help us to understand it, apply it to our life. God, that you would spiritually nourish us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go and have a seat, everyone. When we have our eyes opened to see who Jesus is, we're going to see from this story that three big things happen. The first is that we see that our focus is going to be placed on Jesus. We're going to see that our needs are met by Jesus. And we're going to see that the time for salvation is now. And so let's look at the first one, that our focus is placed on Jesus. Who is this woman? You know, when we read the story, the woman in the story, we never learn her name. We never learn how old she is. We don't learn much about her background or her history. But what she brings to the conversation tells us exactly where her focus is, where her mind's at. She's focused on her social status. She's sitting there talking with a Jewish rabbi, all right, who's requesting water from her. And all that she can think about is, wait a minute, I'm a Samaritan woman and you're a Jewish rabbi and this is not supposed to be happening. Okay, that's where her focus is. So first, of course, you know, she's a Samaritan. We've talked about that. Jews even had laws that 
prohibited them from eating with Samaritans and using the same tools and utensils as them. So for Jesus to ask for water from her was like a huge, uh, a, 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 like a, a huge thing that she was like, this is weird. Like, why are you talking to me? But also the fact that she is a woman is a big deal as well. It would be considered absolutely inappropriate for a woman to have a public conversation with a man who was not her husband like this. And in fact, men never discuss theology with women other than their own wives. Ever. And so this woman, her social status was very low. She knows it. She lives in it every day. And then she comes across this Jewish rabbi at the well. And just talking with him is a reminder of how low her social status is. How low she is on the social ladder. She feels, she probably feels really devalued. She's probably become jaded, hardened by years of just feeling unworthy. And so her focus is all on her social status and not on the Messiah who's sitting right in front of her. She doesn't realize who this is. What are the circumstances in your life that steal your focus away from Jesus? Just think about that for a second. I mean, maybe, maybe you're like the Samaritan woman where it's your social status, where, where it's, it's the status that people place on you, the status that maybe you've accepted for yourself. Maybe you're, you're thumbing through Facebook and you're like, man, how come I don't have like the perfect Facebook family photos like, like this other family that seems to just have it all together? Or maybe you feel like an outsider sometimes because Maybe you just don't like the same things that it seems what everyone else likes, you know? Maybe you feel like an outcast because you don't look like everyone else. Like you don't have the the right kind of hair or you don't wear the right kind of clothes or have the right kind of shoes or have the right kind of smartwatch or things like that. All of this makes us feel devalued. And we have a tendency to focus on those things and it takes our attention away from Jesus Maybe the thing that steals your focus is based on your performance. Maybe you don't make the grades that you think that you should make, and so you feel unaccepted because of that. Or maybe you feel rejected at work because you don't perform the way that maybe other people do. Maybe you keep getting passed up for the promotion or, um, or a raise because of that. Do you feel like sometimes you don't measure up as a Christian? Because maybe, maybe there's still a, a sin that you're struggling with that you're like, man, if, how come I seem to be the only one that's struggling with this? Maybe it's based on finances. Maybe you feel inadequate because your bank account is not where you want it to be. What is it for you? What are the circumstances in your life that seem to steal your focus, kind of, kind of steal your focus away from Jesus who's right in front of you? You know, if anything is our story, this is our story, right? <laughs> it's not a, we, we don't have these, these stories of our righteousness and our holiness and all this sort of stuff. We have these stories where it's, it's that our attention is placed on the wrong thing all the time. We, we've all felt unworthy in the eyes of others. We've all had our focus put on those circumstances in our life. And there's so many problems with this type of thinking, you guys. So many problems with it. But the biggest thing the biggest problem is that it's selfish. It's self-focused. It's that our, our whole life, we, 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 we focus so much on these circumstances and all that it is is just looking inward at ourself continually. It's keeping our attention here rather than looking at the worth and value that Jesus says that we have. And ultimately what this is, let's just call it what it is, it's idolatry. It's idolatry. It's, it's making ourself an idol or it's making that, that circumstance in our life an idol. And what it does at the end of the day is it makes us feel depressed. It makes us anxious and worried and frustrated at the circumstances that we're dealing with. Why aren't things different? The solution to this is nothing more than simply turning to Jesus and it's allowing him to take the attention off of yourself and putting it on him. That's the solution. He wants, he wants to remind you what he thinks about you is all that matters. And he wants your focus 
to be intently on him. And so look at what Jesus does in verse 10, okay? Look at what he does. He's so, he's so gentle with this woman. He says in verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, if, put yourself in the shoes of the woman. You know, you're just thinking about social status. He's a Jew. He's talking to me. What's going on? And all of a sudden, he says this, and now you're thinking, wait a minute. What's, what's the gift of God? And who are you? Right? Her attention has now been shifted. Her focus is now on Christ. But she has no idea who he is. She has no idea that right now she's sitting here at this well having a discussion with the very Son of God, <laughs> you know? And, and there's no way that she would have either. I mean, Isaiah says that he has no stately form or majesty that we would recognize him, right? That, that was the whole thing. And so right now, he's a sweaty, tired, thirsty Jewish traveler. And he's sitting there at a well and she doesn't recognize. She doesn't recognize that he's the one that's going to right every single wrong in our world. That he's the one that's going to bring justice to every injustice that there could ever have been. That he's the one that's going to bring righteousness for every brokenness that is in this world. That, that he is the promised seed of the woman that's going to crush the head of the serpent and she has no idea. <laughs> she has no idea. And in the course of this conversation, Jesus is going to explain these two things to her. He's going to explain, first of all, what is the gift of God and who he is. And I believe the Lord wants us to know the same thing. So let's look at the next thing here. There we, we saw that, that as our eyes are opened, our focus is put on Jesus. And the next thing here is we're going to see that our needs are met by Jesus with the woman's focus now on Jesus, he's going to explain, first of all, what the gift of God really is. And he kind of alluded to it in verse 10. He called it living water. Living water. Now, living water, it, for someone in that, in that time period, if someone said, hey, I'm going to look for living water, it's actually kind of a figurative term that, that really means um, flowing water, like as opposed to stagnant water. It's like, where's the river? All right, that's, that's, what, that's kind of what, it, what, what it's getting down to here. So let's look at verse 11 as we continue the story. Verse 11 says, The woman said to him, um, Sir, <laughs> you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. He's like, look, uh, Jacob was not a fool. He was not an idiot, you know. He would not have spent all the money and all the energy and all the time to dig this well if there was a river nearby. So what are you talking about flowing water? Like this is, this is ridiculous. So now look how Jesus responds. Verse 13. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Okay. And so she recognizes how important this, this well is, first of all. That this well here has been providing for their town for centuries. Okay? Centuries. But Jesus is offering her something different is offering her water that's better than the water from this well. It's a water that becomes a spring of water from within the person that drinks it. And this water will give that person eternal life. It will quench the deepest thirst of your soul and you will never thirst again. And so certainly this woman was confused because she was still thinking very literally about what Jesus was talking about. But she's thinking literally because she doesn't realize the deepest need of her soul. And this is precisely what spiritual blindness does to us. It, it, it blinds us from the deepest need that we have. See, sin has corrupted every single part of us. Our minds and our flesh and our hearts and our, and our will and everything about us has been corrupted by sin. And the gift of God is something that we desperately need because what it does is it will restore us, it will open our eyes, it will give us eternal life, and it becomes a river that flows out of us. It is, 
It is this incredible gift. But before our eyes are open, we never see our, deep, our deepest need. We always think that the problem is everyone else. We always think that the problem is everything around us, and we never see the need within ourselves. And so when the sovereign creator of the universe offers that solution, offers that living water to us, when he does this, we reject it. We reject it, and we try to run and find other things to fill that void in our life. It's like, God, I don't need you. I got this, right? We say that all the time. Jeremiah 2.13 is such an amazing passage that ties into this so well. Listen to this. This is God. He's speaking to us. He says, For my people have committed two evils. Listen to this. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. That's what he says. And the second thing is, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Again, This is our story. This is our story. Our story is that we, because of our spiritual blindness, we continually forsake the living God, the fountain of living waters, the one that can actually give us restoration. And what do we do? We turn to broken cisterns. We turn to all these other things and try to fill that void in our life. And it just never satisfies. Well, Jesus is going to help the Samaritan woman realize her deepest need, her need for living water. And to do this, what he's going to do is he's going to reveal to her the things that she's been turning to, the broken cisterns in her life. Look at the next passage here, verse 15, and look at this interchange that takes place between them. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. This is a really interesting statement. Okay? It seems like now she's on board. She's like, okay, not being thirsty again sounds pretty good. But she has this second little thing in here where she says that she doesn't want to come here to draw water anymore. Why is that? Let's keep reading. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. What Jesus has done here is he's revealed what she's been running to. She's been running to men, to relationships, in order to fill this void in her life, this feeling of unworthiness, so that she could try to find love and restoration and hope in a relationship with a man. And she's been doing this so much that what's happened is that now she has become, I mean, for lack of a better word, kind of the harlot of the town. And so she doesn't come to the well in the morning when all the other women come to the well to get water for the rest of the day. She's here at noon. And she's there because she's wanting to avoid all of the looks, all of the, the snickers, the, the gossip and the discussion around who she is from all of the other women in town. See, here's what's going on. Look, she thought that she was going to find restoration and peace and hope through running to all of these other things. And all that it did was it brought shame to her life. It didn't work. And so the deepest need in her life is that she needs to be freed from her sin and her shame. And by revealing what's going on here, Jesus is drawing that out of her. Look, this is the deepest need that you have. With one simple question, Jesus exposed that deepest need. Do you have a sin in your past that haunts you? Something that maybe is just a constant reminder of that guilt and shame. Or maybe even right now, maybe you're finding yourself trapped in a sin and you don't know how to get out. Do you ever, do you ever feel like the sin in your life has disqualified you from the love of God? 
You ever tell yourself, like, there's no way that God could love me? What Jesus wants you to know this morning is that he has the solution to your guilt and shame. And that you don't have to run to anything else anymore. But he is the fountain of living water that will restore you. That will give you peace and hope that you're looking for. You see, later on in the Gospel of John, Jesus explains exactly what the living water is. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. You see this in John chapter 7. Now here's what's cool, and I I just want to share this with you really quickly. Because the Holy Spirit, there's so many blessings that the Holy Spirit gives us. I want to give you three quick ones. Three things that just should just amaze you that this is what the Holy Spirit does in our life, okay? Let me give you just three quick things. First, the Holy Spirit applies the work of Christ to our life, okay? He applies the work of Christ to our life. When God saves us, okay, the Holy Spirit is the one that takes all the work that Jesus did on the cross, okay? His death and his resurrection and everything, all the blessing of that, he takes that and he applies it to us, And he gives that to us. We can actually see this promise to us in Ezekiel. This is Ezekiel 36. And I'm just going to read it to you. Ezekiel 36, verse 25. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all of your uncleanliness, and from all of your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You could see how much blessing comes from the gift of the spirit in our life, that the spirit is going to cleanse us, he's going to restore us, and he's going to help us to walk in his statutes. Like, the Spirit is an, is an incredible gift to us, okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing is the Holy Spirit is going to confirm that we have been made children of God. He's going to confirm that to you, that you've been made one of his sons or daughters. This is in Romans chapter 8, verse 15. He says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons of by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And so if we ever doubt, if we ever have doubts like, God, am I really yours? Am I really one of your children? You guys, the Holy Spirit helps to confirm that in us, that yes, you have a promise from God that you've been made into one of his children. That's the second thing. Here's the third quick thing, is that the Holy Spirit gives us power power to live in a way that pleases God, okay? That, that you have been given the ability to actually follow God's law. You have. This is right out of Galatians. Probably one of the greatest verses to memorize on this is the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. That the fruit, in other words, what comes forth from us when we have the Spirit inside of us is is all of these things. He says the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law, right? And so, look, if if we're struggling with sin and we want to live a life that is pleasing to God, the Spirit is there to help us with that actually gives us the ability to do it. He is the living water. He's the answer to the deepest need of our soul. Does that make sense? That makes sense? What a blessing the Holy Spirit is to us. And so we see here that as our eyes are open to recognize Jesus, that our focus is placed on Jesus, that our needs are met by Jesus, and the last one is that we see that the time for salvation is now. See, The Samaritan woman, she is absolutely floored about what Jesus has done, okay? Jesus has just told her everything, all of her like deepest, darkest sin, okay? And she's mind boggled by this. Um, We know this because later on, 
what happens is, is she ends up telling the whole town, come and meet the man who told me everything that I've ever done, okay? <laughs> so like, she's floored by this. But her immediate response seems very strange. She, she kind of changes the subject. Look at verse 19. Look at verse 19 here. So she says, <clears throat> the woman said to him, sir, I, I perceive that you're a prophet. Okay, yeah, <laughs> uh, makes sense. Verse 20, now our fathers worshiped on this mountain, our ancestors, they worshiped on this mountain. But you, you Jews, say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Okay, so she's drawing back to the question of this whole worship issue between the Samaritans and the Jews. It's like, okay, you're a prophet, you're Jewish, tell me, tell me who's right. Who's the right one? And I love that she never actually asks a question. Jesus just jumps right in here. <laughs> okay, verse 21. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, but we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, okay, there are so many things we could say about this passage. This passage has so much in there. We could talk about the nature of God being spirit and not having a body. We could talk about worship and what does worship and spirit and truth look like. But I want to focus our attention on one even bigger thing that Jesus is getting to here. And this is a, a, an issue of time. Because twice in his statement, he says the time is coming. The hour is coming. The hour is coming when this whole debate about worship is going to end. This whole debate about whether we worship in Jerusalem or up on the mountain is going to end. Why? Because here's what's going on. The worship that's happening in Jerusalem, where they're making these sacrifices, these animals, where day after day they have to kill goats and rams and bulls and all this blood goes everywhere. If you ever read Leviticus, oh my goodness, like <laughs> there's just blood everywhere. Um, okay, so that, that's, that's all good. That's what God has told them to do. But all of that is just a shadow. It's just a, a picture of a reality that's coming. All of it is just, a, is just a representation of something that's bigger and fuller that's on its way. And it's fulfilled in Christ. Let me explain what I mean. You take the sacrifices, all of these animals that they have to keep keep pouring their blood out in order to cover the sin of the people, but they have to keep doing it. They have to go back to it over and over and over again, which means that it doesn't actually cover their sin. It doesn't actually meet that need. But what's going to happen is that Jesus says, the hour is coming and is now here. And what does he mean? He means, now that I'm here. Because he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the perfect spotless Lamb that now that He is going to go to the cross and die for our sin and His blood is shed, that we don't have to go back to any of these old forms anymore. And so He's like, look, the hour is coming and is now here when you're not going to have to worry about this stuff anymore. And He ends the conversation because the woman's like, okay, well, you know, when the Messiah comes, he'll explain all this stuff. And he's like, you know what? I could just, I could just see him just lean in, looking at her in the eye, and just says, I am he. That's me. He shows her who he is. That he is the way of salvation. Because now, that he has come, the way of salvation has been made so clear that it is through Jesus Christ and through him alone. That salvation is by God's grace and it's obtained by faith alone. Our God is so merciful. He is so merciful. He is so gracious to us. 
He is so gracious that, you guys get this, he promises that he will grant salvation to anybody who asks. Anybody. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. But salvation will be given to you. And all that is required is that we repent and believe. Repentance, all that that is, is turning from the broken cisterns. It's turning from all of those things that we have been running to to try to fill that void in our life. It's turning from all of that stuff and looking to Jesus and saying, Jesus, you're the fountain of living water and the living water is what I need right now. It's the only thing that I need. It's what's actually going to restore me. It's what's actually going to heal me. It's what's actually going to make me whole again. And it's trusting, it's trusting that Christ's sacrifice actually does that for us. It's trusting that he took the punishment that you deserved. That he became sin itself so that you could become the righteousness of God. There's an incredible invitation to this life in Isaiah 55. And in this invitation, God himself invites us to come to the waters. Let me read this to you. He says, come. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, money, or without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we want to thank you so much for your incredible loving kindness towards us. God, we are blind. So often we are, we realize the blindness that we have that, God, that we can't even see you without you helping us to open our eyes to see you. But when you do open our eyes and we get to see you, God, that we can see how much we need you, how much we are just so desperate for your living water, that you would come in and restore us and heal us and make us whole again. And so God, I want to, I want to pray for anyone who is in this room, anyone who's watching online, who, who maybe right now has never taken that step, who's never who's never accepted that gift that you've, that you've offered to them, who's never gone to the living waters and is still running to other things. And Lord, I pray right now, God, that you would, that you would soften their heart, that you would open their eyes, and that you would move in their life in such a way where they would that they would be healed and restored, that they would receive the living water from you now. That you would heal them, God. For those of us who have been there before too, God, we we know that we are Christians. We know that, that that we're counted among your children. But for one reason or another, we keep running back to the old cisterns. We keep running back to these things that don't satisfy us and father we pray for for the help from your spirit that your holy spirit would would renew us that your holy spirit would give us power to combat the sin in our life that your holy spirit would draw us back to you and your living water regenerate us and renew us lord because you are all we need We thank you, Lord, for your gift of grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.